So today we are having our SPW online workshop, and the topic is basic photography. So first of all, thank you for joining today, and uh, I'm sure you will get something. So this is my just introduction. I'm the I'm a, my name is Sumit Dhupar, and I'm a professional photographer and digital artist. And I have over 2,000 creations, but uh, currently it's at 3,000. So I just must update this. I have over 3,000 creations in my own and Gandhi. You can search my portfolio on Facebook and uh, majorly. And I have my say uh, selected content on uh, Zoom, Flickr, and Instagram. Since March 2017, I'm active in photography. And particularly, I do specialize, specialize in expressive portrait work. So whenever I find portrait of people in a street photography, I try to find the different expressions uh, because the street photography is all about capturing moments. So if, if I'm lucky and I'm finding a moment, I, I never miss a chance to capture it. But besides that, I do love to do uh, creative art photography and I, I revolve around still life photography and nature art because these are my personal favorite when I like to spend some time with the from my camera I usually have a setup for my home studio for still life photography or I, I can go outside for nature photography and, uh, so the topic is how DSLR works so we here we can see two diagrams of a DSLR camera. One is the diagram of a camera while it's a shooting, while the image is, uh, image is being captured, and other is when the capture process is completed. So if we see the first image on the left hand, on the left hand, we'll see that uh, how the light is uh, reaching the sensor, and first which pass through the lenses and it reaches the sensor reflex mirror where it, it uh, reaches word, uh, horizontally and then reflect and make it look uh, vertical and it helps light reach the penta prism so penta prism is a combination of glass where uh, it makes the light vertical light horizontal so it makes the light horizontal and it helps the light pass through viewfinder so we can, we can um, see the image what is in front of lens so that's how the image we can see from the viewfinder but if you have noticed that viewfinder is only able to show image when the lcd view is turned off if you turn on lcd view you will not be able to see through the viewfinder so that may you need to be take care about it that when you are capturing image and looking through viewfinder uh, that how it works and we have uh, components here lenses uh, reflex mirror we have matte focusing screen and the third so this is uh, uh, the matte focusing screen you can see on top of it the number penta prism is the fourth number here it is the penta prism and then eyepiece as we all know this is the viewfinder focal plane shutter this is focal plane shutter we call and sensor the, the last you can see the strip of line that's it that is sensor and this is the symbol of light so how the light is traveling so if you see it's uh, the flex mirror is at 45 degree angle so when uh, when it will be like this so only when when you will press the shutter release button let's see so when we press the shutter release button the reflect mirror uh, come in a position of 45 degree angle to help light reflect and reach the penta prism which can further travel to our eyes but when we complete the shoot that reflex mirror goes to its original position on top and block the light so we can see we uh, when when it's complete the picture so the light is directly uh, capturing into the sensor so when we press the shutter button reflex mirror goes up 
to let the light reach the sensor so image capture process complete so that's how the image is captured on the sensor on the right side we'll see uh, on the right diagram we can see the image of a camera where image is being captured on the sensor the moment of shooting the photograph you taking passes through the lens uh, the light into reflex mirror that is fixed at 45 degree so all these are in detail uh, you can just uh, when you watch the video you can pause it in the middle and you can read it carefully if you if you want to understand more it so here we are in the next slide where we will talk about exposure balance exposure balance you must have seen a light meter on your camera whenever you are doing shooting in a manual mode specifically you this light meter works and it will helps you analyze the light condition so how to make your photos lighter and darker generally we make our photos lighter and darker by raising iso or lowering the shutter speed that's how we allow this uh, light to reach more to into the sensor but in the post processing we have option to raise the uh, brightness in a in a uh, raw file if we have a raw file we can easily image uh, we can brighter the image uh, without uh, impacting much of the quality but it's better if we do it on own camera then it will be more easy for us to work on the processing part camera light meter is not an error free so light meter is not always error free we we can see a condition where camera is not able to tell that if a subject is in good light condition or not so this can happen when we have majority of the portion in a frame which looks brighter or darker then camera really gets confused that a subject is just in front and is not able to judge so on those conditions we use exposure compensation and we will cover that topic later in this workshop and there is a complete presentation on that topic high contrast scene can trick your camera so if um, if uh, images having frame where as uh, background is too, uh, very highly contrast and subject can miss in between and camera can uh, can can find a difficult time to focus on and you must have seen when uh, we have a very busy background and in especially in the nature when not of green uh, uh, elements in the background we sometimes we miss to focus and camera not let us focus so in that scenario we have to be very careful uh, over focal point and we can even use manual focus that can also help using exposure compensation in different shooting modes so as i told you that we can use exposure compensation and depends on the what shooting modes we are it will help exposure compensation is only available if you are shooting in your camera's program it means we have exposure compensation available only if we are using for camera in program mode aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode in manual modes we have to decide how the light falls on the sensor so there light meters in actual works light meter may be visible in other modes but it will not work in actual it works only in manual mode so be careful when you are using light meter to judge a light you have to be in manual mode and for exposure compensations we have buttons uh, dedicated button on camera device so here are few examples on canon how it looks uh, we have this button uh, ab from uh, plus minus in nikon we have just dedicated plus minus button in fuji camera we have a dial so there you it, you can see the numbers it's a kind of light meter itself you can see on the positives and negative values 
and how the image can be balanced. So, how the exposure uh, balance takes place uh, in actual? A plus sighting will make your image brighter than the standard exposure. So, if we are having an image and we add the exposure here, as we discussed, that exposure compensation can help you uh, make subject look darker or bright, uh, brighter. So if we add more values here, like the plus one, plus two, the image will look more brighter. While if we do minus setting, that, that will make image looks uh, darker. So here I have two examples where one background is consists of bright part and the other is the other image is uh, where background consists of dark parts. So if we go brighter in the in the in the first example where we have flower port, if we go brighter, uh, add the values, make the settings plus, then you can see we will reach a state on plus two where image looks pure white. So we are getting pure white. But if you see in the middle, when we have no exposure compensation apply, the image looks quite dull and light not looking very good. So we have used exposure compensation to make image look brighter and in a better exposure. So on the other side, we have a frame of a model where background is black but if you see the exposure of minus two so we have a minus two setting there we can still feel the background so some part we can see and if we do minus three setting of exposure composition the background becomes completely black or quite dark so we cannot identify or differentiate between the model and the backgrounds and it all depends on your taste composition at personal, I, I like to have background a little bit light, so we have some uh, different shade uh, or we can feel the edges around head, which makes uh, more of a interesting look for me. But it depends on your personal taste, how you want to, you know, how you want the image look alike. So try, try to be your own, uh, try to be your own vision and feel and make an image how, how it will feel to others. So if you feel good about it, it will feel, it, the others will feel good about the image. That's the key thing in a photography. So we have to make image as interesting as possible. So with each movement up or down, the scale recorded as a stop. So when we do any increment or decrease in uh, settings, we, we, we call this uh, term as stop. We have added stop or we have uh, reduced stop. So one stop less, less or one stop high. We can say like this. So that's a technical term. Increment, we call that. If full stop, the adjustments will double or half the exposure. So we, when we say full stop, we can just double the exposure or when we say half stop, it will half the exposure. It means if you see minus one and plus one, so just uh, you can see the difference. And on the plus one, it looks brighter and the minus one, it looks very dark. But most of the camera affords uh, immediate half stop or third stop increments. So in, in uh, Nikon and it's a third stop increments for more subtle adjustments and but some camera offers half stop increments also So now we will talk about and discuss camera modes In, in the camera modes we have we have these buttons available to uh, navigate to different modes uh, it's a M A S P. So these are camera modes you must have seen in your camera settings and in your device. In Canon, we have uh, similar modes uh, where uh, aperture is A V and shutter is T V. So they works, and purpose is same 
but the naming standard is different but you don't get you should not get confused in that and the purpose and the target will be remain same for those modes so here uh, because i i have nikon device and most of the time i'm working with those uh, terms so i try to keep the content uh, relative to nikon only but you can uh, use this information in other device because they, they also have the similar modes so psa and m modes these are these modes are called exposure modes and why will they call exposure modes because they helps you decide exposure based on the different camera settings we also have other modes like auto scene but these are more of a uh, more for a uh, user who is very new to device and who, who is not much aware about uh, the, these modes uh, and because these modes require some efforts in settings and in auto and scene modes uh, the camera will take all the efforts and it will give you the best exposure uh, where possible in auto and scene modes the camera controls shutter speed and aperture so as i said that camera take all efforts camera controls the device and it will give you uh, the best possible exposure p s a and m modes are known as exposure modes and why they call uh, why be, why they known as exposure modes because they'll give you all the settings in hand which you can manipulate and adjust to get the exposure as per your interest and give photographers a choice which elements of exposure so which elements you want in more exposure or under exposed that's a uh, control you have in these modes and we can control the aperture and shutter speed uh, as the name suggests a aperture as a shutter speed so we have control in a we have control on aperture and as we have control on shutter speed we'll have detailed discussion going forward in the same workshop and you can see this uh, screen that's how it looks on the camera this is the screen from a uh, nikon and you can see the camera settings like this so on the 1 by 160 the shutter speed is f2.8 is aperture and aperture is always denoted with the f number so when you see f uh, and new some numeric so that is aperture and you can see the plus minus the light meter so that is the light meter we were talking about so this light meter works well and available when you are in manual mode okay, we will have some uh, more brief detail or some uh, discussion on these modes mode p program mode the camera automatically adjusts aperture shutter speed for optimal exposure so program mode is a kind of auto mode but it still give you liberty to select uh, settings aperture and shutter speed so if you uh, have a shutter speed uh, adjusted by yourself the camera will take care about the aperture and if you adjust the aperture the camera will take care about the shutter speed so ultimately the goal is camera will give you the best possible exposure it's a kind of auto but it, you still have control on these two settings so uh, most of the time when we take a record shots we'll use a program mode because in program mode we'll get idea about what the exit settings we will use for when we are shooting in the manual mode and this mode also known as flexible program because it's very flexible and, and at any light condition you can use the program mode mode as cv is a shutter priority in, in canon is a s mode and in in canon it's a tv mode in nikon it's a s mode so I'll, we call this as shutter priority and when the photographer you select this shutter priority the camera automatically adjusts the aperture for optimal exposure and as we said how because it's adjusting the other part 
we are controlling shutter speed but it's adjusting the aperture so in the uh, in the mode a and ev aperture priority auto will will we can adjust the aperture uh, as a, as a, the as we uh, discussed in the program board that if we adjust the aperture it will uh, the camera will take care about uh, the other part the shutter speed so if you see uh, program mode is a combination of both shutter priority and aperture priority so uh, in program mode we will have both but why we have s mode and s a mode separately why because there will be some scenarios in some light uh, some conditions where you want to have more uh, importance on the shutter speed or more importance on the aperture in those scenarios we can just navigate to these modes instead of selecting program mode so i can give you example in shutter priority we have a, uh, we have a event where sport event we want to capture the motions of uh, players and in those scenario we have to use high shutter speed so it's better to go with the uh, shutter priority mode and the aperture will be calculated based on the light condition by your camera and in aperture priority mode we will be more concerned about the uh, blurness in the background the bokeh and where we have a good light condition we can easily go to the aperture priority mode and depend it's mostly used in the street photography or even we can use in a portrait work in a wildlife animal portraits also we can easily use this when the light condition is good you will you will have a better chance the camera will give you good and at speed and you can easily capture the movement with this mode and mode m so when you capture any image with a mode m manual so it means all the settings are controlled by you being a photographer you have to take care of all the settings aperture shutter speed and you have to adjust both the settings to get a better exposure and sometimes we with with purpose uh, do under expose uh, over expose and that is only possible in uh, manual mode because it will give you more creative and hand control than other modes and other modes so uh, most of the time you will find the exposure is balanced but if you really want a high key or low key for image then it is a mem mode is your friend and you can easily work with that uh, choosing wrong combination if you are new to your camera device and if you select wrong combination and unknowingly you will have over exposure and under exposed image where you want the image look balanced so it's for those who are new to camera device and they don't know how to use camera in the manual mode so those uh, users can start working with the or semi auto modes uh, this shutter priority aperture priority or program mode and then they gradually can elevate their photography skills and move to next level using manual mode and you can use a camera indicator exposure indicator as a guide when choosing aperture and shutter priority so camera indicator is nothing but the light meter so light meter will give you opportunity to know before in even pressing the shutter release button that you can know that uh, it's a uh, going to be overexposed or underexposed so try to be careful when you are in manual mode in all three modes p s and a exposure is automatically adjusted for adjusted for optimal results so as we discussed all semi modes are designed in a way you will get good exposure every time because camera is taking care of other part of settings we have auto focus and we have manual focus why why we use auto focus why we use manual focus it's a very big question and most of the time we get confused in figuring in figuring out that when we should use these 
autofocus is very simple to understand so camera is uh, when in autofocus it's deciding that uh, when the, your subject will be in sharp focus and sensor uh, will be used by the camera and we will have some uh, uh, specific uh, distance for each aperture where you will get a, a sharp uh, sharp focal point so you have to be very careful that in uh, in which aperture you are and you have to be when you have to maintain your distance according to that so if you see these images uh, you will see then cam in nikon it, uh, it is having focusing modes afa afs afc mf all these are focusing modes and in canon we have af operations so we have three choices here a one shot ai focus ai servos we will discuss in details in the next slides so just we just we understand that ai focus is auto focus uh, what is afa in nikon so the, these are uh, the, both are common but the name looks different okay which focus uh, mode you are in so, so you how you will know that what focus mode i am mean? so it's very easy, very easy and uh, camera nowadays are really good at their uh, interface and you can easily find all the settings and all the enabled features on your info screen to see which focus mode you are currently in you can just press the info button on your dslr camera however the focus mode settings might be displayed using an icon or the initials af and mf so if you see uh, the these two images you will have afa on the left image which is from the canon or uh, nikon and the right hand will have image which is from canon in canon we have one shot so we know that we are in one shot focusing mode and in the left hand on the nikon info screen we have afa so we know that we are in afa uh, focusing mode so that's how we understand that which more focusing modes we are in and depends on what kind of shooting we are going to do we have to change our focusing mode if required and how it will be done sometimes you can set the focus mode on the interchangeable lens so lens also has the focus mode buttons and you can just slide the switch af mf and or we have moving button moving between auto focus and manual focus by sliding the switch manual focus so it's a uh, denoted as mf with manual focus you are going to use the palm of your left hand to cut the lens so we have to hold uh make our palm like this and put the camera like that so that's how we we decide that we'll be giving more stability to our camera then use your left hand fingers to slightly twist the focus ring and on the dslr lens until the image is in sharp focus so it's all about doing manual focusing so we here we are not letting camera to decide which is the sharpest focus point it is we are deciding we are deciding so hold the camera properly is the key aspect of making use of manual focus if you can hold the camera very steadily and uh, it's kind of you are looking like a tripod then only you can use the fo manual focusing mode handheld but be careful it's designed in such a way we will we'll expect that when we, you are in manual focusing mode you have you have to have a tripod in place because it will be tripod will give you more stability and will give you more control on the long exposure because even even uh, photographers take images of many minutes and how in hours they put camera on the tripod which you can't do in the handheld so tripod is recommended 
autofocus. So as we discussed that autofocus single servo is a good for stationary objects. So it, stationary subjects are designed to be easily captured when we are in autofocus mode. As the focus loads, so when the shutter is pressed halfway, it will just lock the focus there. And that's how we use AFS. And in AFC, that is a continuous uh, focus mode, continuous servo is good for moving subjects as the out of focus continually can adjust. So if subject is going forward from lens or coming to, towards lens, so it will keep calculating the focus. So by the time when you press the shutter button, the subject will be in sharp state. AFA, auto servo. This is a fully auto focus mode where the camera will choose which of the two of the focus modes is more appropriate to use. So camera, if you find the subject is moving or going away or going or uh, coming towards the lens, it will quickly sense that it's a, some continuous movement going on and it will use the focusing mode as a continuous. But if subject thinks the subject is stationary and subject is not moving, even a person who is holding himself for his seconds or for a few minutes in one place, the camera can think that person is a stationary subject and it will capture the image in AFS in the single servo mode. So that's how the camera swiftly changed to different modes in AFA. So now we will just talk about in a little bit more detail for shutter speed. Shutter speed is a measurement of the time the shutter is open shown in seconds or fraction of seconds. So you can see some uh, numbers here 1s, 1x2s, 1x4s, 1x2ts, 1x4500s. So all are different shutter speeds. So it starts with the longer exposures, one seconds, and it's end with the one by 500, the fast shutter speed. So that's how you can change to different shutter speeds in shutter speed, uh, shutter priority mode. The faster the shutter speed, the shorter the time, the image sensor will expose to the light. So the faster the shutter speed, the shutters, uh, the sensor will cl close quickly. And if you have slow shutter speed and long exposure, then it'll open and keep it remain open until the exposure completes. So when the exposure completes, the shutter just lock. So that's how the uh, shutter speed works with the sensor and let the sensor open for a long time or close the center, can sensor as quickly as possible. So even the moving sub, uh, subject looks steady when captured in fast shutter speed. So that's how we capture motions to look static with higher shutter speeds. And the faster the movement, the higher the shutter speed you need to capture uh, the subject looks very static. So yeah, I, I have seen an example of hummingbird. So the, the, in the, in the, even the latest uh, technologies are not uh, fast enough to capture the bird look static of hummingbird. Uh, the feather looks static of hummingbird. They are so much fast in motion, and even if you have one by eight thousand shutter speed, you will feel some blurness around feathers. So the the, low, the lower shutter speed, the longer time the image sensor was exposed to lights. So you can see these two images. One is captured as the fast shutter speed where the person, you can see the feet looking, uh, looks in air, but still not blurred. And here on the right side, uh, the image is captured using slow shutter speed. The frame is quite similar, but the person looking in motion, and sometimes with purpose we do this to for art photography. Sometimes we capture image where some motions appear which uh, creates sense of motion in an image. So in creative art photography, you do that. 
So shutter priority button, uh, when, when we have a, a cam, uh, when we have settings and all I'm, talk, I'm talking about, so it's a button where on the camera settings, on the, on the device we'll have this dial button where we have S. So S is uh, from the uh, from Nikon dial button, it's S. And in the Canon we'll have TV mode. So that's how we navigate to shutter, uh, shutter priority mode. And these are the sample uh, speed values that on the left, if we navigate, we will have long exposure on the right we will see the uh, all figures are one by uh, some uh, numbers one by 125 one by 500 one by 2000 one by 4000 so all are high shutter speed and if you see the uh, how the shutter speed increment works it's it's a third stop if you just see how it starts so this uh, this is what we call a one step or stop choosing a shutter speed one step faster than the current shutter speed but for example changing the shutter speed from 1 by 60 to 1 by 25 seconds is referred to as increasing shutter speed by one step and half the amount of time the shutter is open so if we are increasing the shutter speed it's reducing the time of uh, shutter to uh, open so it will close the shutter uh, quicker than before so we will have very uh, very fast capture there okay choosing a shutter speed one step slower than the current shutter speed for example by changing shutter speed from 1 by 125 to 1 by 160 it's a wide, it's a very opposite to the above example is referred to as a slowing shutter speed by one step so the double the amount the time shutter is open so we are letting the sensor to open double amount of time by reducing the shutter speed so it's a kind of we are reaching on the left side to let the sensor remain open for few more uh, fractions of seconds So if you are using Nikon DSLR camera, shutter speed change uh, shutter speed changes in one by three steps, one by third uh, steps. Uh, we say some models also support increment of one step or one by two steps. So as we discussed, so inc third increment stops. So one by third, most of the Nikon device supports this, but some also support one stop full and one by two steps. So when you are buying it on a DSLR device, you have to be very careful on this. That oh, and if you really concerned about this, then you have to check the device details before buying. So now we'll talk about aperture priority mode. So in Nikon, it's an A mode, and in Canon, it's an AB. Aperture controls the brightness of the image that passes through the lens and falls on the image sensor. It is expressed as an F number. So as we discussed earlier, so it's F number which notify us that this is the aperture. And F slash is followed by a number, such as F1.4, F2, and so on. So we have large, the small F number, the large aperture, the large F number, the small aperture. So people really get confused in that small aperture, large aperture. So try to make it simple. Both are opposite in terms of when we uh, talk about the settings. Large aperture, small f number. Small aperture, large f number. So f32 is having a large number. So it's a small aperture. f1.4 is having a small f number. So it's a large aperture. So and we, we in large aperture, we have different term also we can say wide aperture so widest possible aperture we will have on the lens is 1.4 so the lenses which offer the wide possible aperture avoiding uh, the 
the larger culture and the possible so 1.4 is costlier than 1.8 so if you compare the cost of lenses uh, like a uh, 85 mm portrait lens if we look at the cost of lens uh, f1.4 is almost cost double than the f1.8 an aperture value used in frame decides the depth of field so dof we must have heard about these terms depth of field so it's decided by uh, these aperture numbers and depth of field decides what are the factors uh, when which decides that what will be the depth of field so it's aperture is one of them but what are others so it's a distance in front of and behind the focus point so what is our focus point focus point is where we focus on a subject so if we are focusing on eyes of a portrait then some uh, part in front of eyes will be in focus including nose and some part uh, behind the eyes will be in focus like ears so we have to be very careful uh, when deciding portrait and we we'll have to be careful for distance that what would be the because at different distance on the same aperture you will have different depth of field so you can use dof calculator depth of field calculator easily available on the android app and uh, i use devices you can easily uh, just uh, put your exif settings in the application and they'll give you what would be the depth of field you will get uh, in particular settings then including uh, uh, adding the distance factor that what is the distance between you and the subject i i most of the time use this in my still life photography because i try to have a very small f number large aperture to get soft feel in the images but at the same time i want uh, whatever elements objects i'm using in the photography uh, in the my in my project they should all look in good Uh, sharp focus. So the details matters when it comes of still still life photography. If number increased depth of field, low if number decreased depth of field. So you can see these images. So just an example that if you see uh, just in the high if number when we have the very you know, Very small aperture here. Yeah. You can see everything is in focus, and on the on the lower number, you will have very shallow depth of field. So, where the focus would be around this box, on the fifth number, where you can see the focus looking sharp, and and anything behind the subject or in front of subject looks out of focus. so the dial button uh, is from nikon and we have a uh, in the dial button which uh, notifies this is the aperture priority mode and in canon it will be av so again uh, we have these the uh, reference table that how the f number changes we have 1.4 f2 f2.8 f4 f5 and 6 so it's it's gradually increase or gradually decrease on the left and it's going on large f num uh, on the small f number to large aperture and on the right it's going on high f num small aperture raising f number referred to as is stopping aperture down one step so as we discuss in the shutter priority mode it's a, it's a quite similar to that but here we are talking about f numbers so f stops we will say these as f stops these halves uh, are these halves the area of aperture or opening holding the brightness of the image that falls on the image sensor lowering the f numbers by one step refer to referring to as a stopping aperture step up a step 
or stepping aperture of an f stop this doubles the area of capturing uh, so th that's uh, that's how we design that if we are just uh, increasing the f number so it's uh, just letting us capturing more and increasing it it helps us, it helps us increase the depth of field So loading F number will reduce the depth of field and raising F number will increase the depth of field. But loading F number has a benefit. It's letting more light in and let, uh, let the image look more brighter. You must have seen image uh, in a given light condition in a lower F number looks more brighter. If you raise the F number, they look darker. Why? Because it's letting the camera uh, get more light on small f number and in the high f number, they let uh, the lesser light compared to that. And image will look underexposed. So we have to balance that. And uh, when we are in a low light condition, it is advised to have small f, f number. The whatever the smallest possible on your device, you can use that. To get the low light uh, photography in night uh, night time photography we many times use low f number if you're using nikon dsl camera shutter speed changes one by third so it's the same from the last uh, slide and some model also supports increments of one step and one by two step so, so de de depend on device to device we'll have a uh, different uh, control and the cost also varies because of these controls. So the third uh, factor uh, in, a, in exposure calculation is ISO. Most of the time, we'll talk about ISO and we have very, uh, very different uh, perception that ISO can put negative impact on image, but it's true. It can create noise in image, but it also helps you capture the image looks in good exposure by letting the camera sense more light. So be careful and you can use it in your favor also. If you use it very delicately and you can use the ISO just to get more creative results. And sometimes you will get away with the result which you will not be able to capture without ISO sensitivity so capturing milky wave uh, is something uh, where high iso can help you but that for that you need to find a place where the, there is no light so the darkest possible area you will need to find uh, to capture that iso sensitivity is a measure of the camera's ability to capture light digital camera converts the light that falls on the image sensor into electrical signals for first processing. The use of sensitivity is raised uh, by amplifying the signal. In other words, the, if ISO sensitivity is raised from ISO 100 to ISO 200, while aperture is left unchanged, the same exposure can be achieved. So it means if we are, we are not using or we are not changing any other settings, just the ISO. If we increase the ISO, we can get double exposure or we can get double light reaching to sensor in the same light condition so just imagine if you have a low light condition and you can't afford to uh, lower the or make the aperture more wider because um, not all lens will let you reach f 1.4 you will find a lens which is limited to f 5.6 6.3 so you don't have liberty to that so what you will do, and uh, you don't want to miss your uh, shot or you want to just capture the frame. In that scenario, you can use high ISO, but you have to be very careful that what is the ISO suitable to your device. Not all device can recover noises or can recover details from noises. So you have to find a balance that what the maximum ISO you can use on your device. If you use a high, uh, high ISO, you can choose faster shutter speeds. 
and reduce camera blur. So it's uh, it's the same thing that uh, camera handshake introduced when you use your device handheld on a lower shutter speed. But uh, if it's really going very low or shutter speed is very low to be even holding, then uh, handshake will come into play and it's very difficult to capture sometimes. So in that scenario, you can raise shutter uh, ISO in that level. It will let you select the handheld shutter speed. So that's how you can manage it. So that's why people say that ISO sensitivity should be raised if lighting is poor. So in so in low light condition, you should use when the light is really poor and you have to have capture. We can use uh, a flash, no flash, low light photography. But if you see these examples, image where one image captured using flash on the left side, photo taken with flash on the right side, photo taken with high ISO uh, with flash off. And if you notice on the right side, the image look more balanced, and you can see uh, the objects behind the model and they are also in light it is high iso capture but again it's look more balanced and in the left side if you see the flash captured image the light almost stops traveling because flash has a limited range all flash has limited range and depends on which flash you have you have to find it that what range is your flash is some flash can go 20 feet and some flash can go 30 feet so it's it's all depends what the flash power what the flash model you are using and quality varies depends on flash uh, uh, levels so some entry level flash will give you flat images some good high quality flash speed lights will give you more soft look so if you raise ISO safety, you can ultimately expose both the portrait subject and background without using flash at all. So that's what is shown in the image and right side. So noise at ISO. As we discussed that raising ISO can introduce noise in your image, but it will allow you faster shutter speeds. So how, how, what, what is that noise, what it means? So noise is nothing but some artifacts in air which uh, uh, starts visible uh, in a high ISO. In other sense, uh, camera is able to capture those particles when using high ISO because it's highlighting that. It's capturing the light even from those particles. So high ISO start showing those particles and which call we as uh, which we call as noise artifacts into your photographs making them seemingly grainy so some photographer do this with purpose and some photographers do create grainy effect with purpose even in post processing they create looks captured in high iso even then the image is not captured in high iso image captured and lower iso but still they make image look more grainy because now this processing softwares allow add grainy effect in image. But if you have a, a, a condition where light is poor and you still want to capture the image and if you sense some creative results, then you can capture the image at high ISO convert into black and white and they'll look really canvas like art. That's how you can make it into your favor. The same is true for all digital cameras. We recommend that you raise high ISO sensitivity only as high as high as needed to avoid blur. So it, again, it is only advised to use high ISO, but at the level when you use your camera handheld. So if you don't have tripod, you have to use uh, uh, your camera at that shutter speed where camera allows you handheld so it's a very simple technique so if you are in focal length of uh, 300 mm so you have to have a shutter speeds of 
one by three hundred or higher. So one by three hundred shutter speed you will not find uh, in your device settings. So you have to be on one by three twenty. That that is the least shutter speed you should have to capture handheld image when you in you are in three hundred mm uh, focal length. So this image you can see this is sample that how the uh, noise uh, travels. Uh, we have different ISO settings. ISO one uh, two eight zero zero. So twelve thousand eight hundred having more ISO, or we can say double uh, amount of noise compared to sixty four hundred. And then again we are having thirty two hundred, where sixty four hundred is having double ISO compared to thirty two hundred. So if we travel to this. And until the hundred, hundred is the least amount of noise. Nowadays, professional and device supports fifty ISO, also, even lower than that. So that's how we can manage the ISO level. But it can, uh, it it will not let you capture some moments which is really required high ISO. If you see the Galax uh, Milky Way. Is quite clearly visible around 3200 ISO. So that is the recommended ISO value when we do uh, this for astronaut photography when we are capturing stars and all. Then it is recommended or advised to have ISO 3200 because it will let you capture these Milky Way. ISO sensitivity can be set manually by the photographer or automatically by the camera. So we can have ISO settings uh, set by ourselves manual, or we can have auto ISO function enabled in the device. You can check your device manual, and you can find the settings easily. And that how you can set your camera to auto mode or uh, manual. Manual is by default. So how you can set your camera to auto mode? You can find the setting easily. Some ca some camera has shortcuts for that on the device buttons, and some have some have settings there where you can use it. One short focusing mode. So. One shot focusing mode is AF. One shot in Canon, AFS in Nikon, which represents single focus capability. So one shot means we have a focal point, and we have to use that focal point to capture our subject. But it will be locked when we are uh, capturing the subject. Like if we are having Bird sitting on a branch, and we are capturing that. We have to press half shutter button, and then subject will be in lock uh, focus. So focus will be locked. So if subject moved, uh, it will uh, change the location. Then we have to refocus and lock the focus again. So it's not a continuous focus. It's a single shot, one shot, and we have to. Be very careful, and when we find a stationary kind of subject, then only we have to use it without losing the sharpness or sharp details from the subject. And there is no continuous movement. This mode saves battery power and ideal for subject that aren't moving. So most of the time, uh, we use one shot or single servo because it helps save the battery power. If you are using a continuous mode, it will. Let your camera re, uh, recalculate the focus uh, as and when the subject change the position, and because it's a focusing system, is also need as some power from your device. It will impact the battery, and it can drain your battery faster if you continuously using uh, or capturing the images in continuous mode. So try to be very careful which mode you you should be in, and we'll have focal points like these. Depends on how many focal points you activate, because some device supports nine, eleven, fifty, thirty-nine. It's a, it's a, there are many. So some even supports a, many many range focal points. Some high-end devices. 
so you have to be very careful which uh, how many focal points you want so so the best advice is keep it around 11 because the lesser the focal points you will have you can navigate to any of the focal point if you want or you can keep the uh, focal point at the center only because center focal point is the strongest one it's the strongest sensor to uh, for focusing if you have a device where it supports uh, navigating you to different focal point it can help you in some uh, conditions you will, you will find where you have to change the focal point to different uh, point but it can impact the details marginally not not easily visible but still it, it will it will put some impact of detail so try to keep your focal point at the center only and many devices allow you to keep only single point so you will be have no option but to keep that focal point at the center you can lock it efs is a, is then the nikon which is uh, referred to as a single shot single servo single focus and in, uh, in canon we have one shot so you can see both the images how it looks like in both devices continuous focusing modes so AF, uh, it's a it's a ai servo in the canon and in the nikon it's afc it stands for continuous focus and this is most this mode is most useful for keeping uh, your moving subject should look sharp so as we uh, discussed about fast shutter speeds that more uh, any moving subject can be look static or look uh, very uh, sharp when we are capturing image with the uh, fast shutter speed but with continuous uh, focus we can utilize the sharp fast shutter speed in a better sense so many times i use this technique in a bird photography where i have to chase bird which is a little bit heavy moving or flying and i can use some other modes uh, like a tracking mode to capture that bird in more details but we have to keep that subject in our frame and to capture it to capture the subject in the continuous mode in continuous focusing mode the camera object subjects movements uh, and refocus according to keep the subject object uh, sharp as tag so it will keep follow the subject and when you press the shutter is button it will make sure that subject will uh, captured in sharp details but as we discussed in s mode that use less battery and in uh, continuous mode the it use a lot of battery power because it is continuously focusing and refocusing so afc is in the can, uh, nikon and ai servo in the can that's how the settings looks on the device automatic focusing mode so this is the last of that focusing modes AI is focus it's in canon and afa in the nikon so this is the automatic automatic focusing mode as we discussed earlier it will it is the camera which decides when it should be in afs when it should be in afc so continuous and static uh, subject decided by your camera not by you you may think the subject is having movement but if subject stays still for seconds camera think that subject is stationary so it can be otherwise so this is this is the this this is uh, the line i added myself that you have to remember that photography can be an art and in art you have to go with what's your mind's eyes what's in your mind eyes so you have to frame the image in your mind before even capture if you can do that then you will be one step ahead of your device so that's uh, that's the key thing and 
very important and very critical in image capturing in photography that you have to plan your frame in your mind if you plan it well you will find most of the time that result will be better and you will feel uh, very satisfied with your result because you planned it before even capture this mode maintain focus in your if you change subject or subject move so if you change one subject to other so if you're capturing a tree and move to other you know, better subject around you in ai focus or auto focus mode uh, camera quickly adapt this condition and refocus on the new subject or if subject movement moves uh, to different position you can just refocus on the subject and camera will do refocusing for you so it automatically switches from one shot to ai server so that's how it's a shift in the focusing modes So earlier we were discussed about some buttons and all. So here you can see the images. In the camera, we have AF and M button. In the lens also, we have A and M button. So all these buttons are used to control auto focus and manual focus. So if your device uh, not having setting for that, then some lenses, even many lenses nowadays, supports uh, this uh, function most of the time you will not see uh, in uh, prime lenses but now now this few prime lenses also coming with this feature this is mf in nikon which stands for manual focus mf stands for manual focus on many lenses you would see af mf switch or focus mode selection Manually focusing the camera is perhaps the most frustrating barrier between the good and great photography. So this is the key thing, and it can be a big difference between average and better and good photographer. That how you can use the manual focusing modes. So manual focusing mode is nothing but controlling where you should focus, and when you sense that focus is at the right point on the subject. Then that, that is your goal, and you will have the better visual impact on the image as compared to autofocus, which can shift to other uh, point around that uh, your in point of interest. So, if you can control manual focus, most of the time you will you will get better result, and you can start even practicing of that. Try to spend one hour a day or two hour if possible. With the and practice with the manual focus and and you, a day will come when you will feel more comfortable with manual focus. Achieving a perfect focus requires using the distance measurement on the lens pedal. And some lenses have a distance uh, table there. So, uh, on the lens, you will you will see lenses where they define distance also with the aperture. So at at very aperture, you will get. They you will have your subject at that distance, and you can use that distance with the measuring tapes. So to get that uh, sharpest possible for, uh, possible uh, possibility on the subject, using the distance from the lens to the subject with the tape measures. So this will give you the most accurate focus points. So measuring tape. So I've seen I've seen photographers using measurement tapes. So that's how the uh, focus criticality go for them and they can they travel with the measuring tapes every time with them and when they find a position or condition where they can use the measuring tape they use it manual focusing mode so in manual focusing mode uh, there is a diapometer adapter adapter there's a adapter adjustment on most of the DSLR. You can see this image and you can see the small button around viewfinder. That's adapter adjustment. It'll, it'll let you adjust the um, your eyes to get your, uh, overcome the, your eyesight, uh, eyes, lower, lower vision of uh, your eye to overcome that part. 
so if you have a spec uh, for your eyes to see the things uh, looks uh, clear you can adjust this and it will mimic that lens uh, your uh, it will mimic uh, with your specs and it will let you see the uh, subject clear even without using specs so you have to be very careful and you can adjust it if you see that it's giving the same result as your specs then you can uh, you can avoid using specs uh, while uh, using the dslr device okay, let's you make a minute adjustment to the focusing capacity based on based upon the irregularities in your eye cells as i said if you have some irregularities in your eyes you can adjust adjust it with the adapter uh, to compatible with your eyes you can also use depth of field preview button to help determine focus um, but this is a more advanced technique so why we say this is a more advanced technique because uh, you are adjusting or you are checking where how the image will will look like after pressing shutter release button once the, it's captured how it will look like it can give you preview of that and you have to check that and then you have to uh, have to recompose the image we have to and uh, change the angle and all that's how you can uh, make it the image look more professional and you can use it when when focus is essential when you focus on known traditional subject for example a subject uh, that is in the background when the foreground is busy and dominating so if you have a very busy background like uh, uh, in the street photography i've faced this many uh, this problem many times when many people moving in the background and i have my subject just in front of them and i'm also at the very far distance so it's very difficult to have a focus on the subject and uh, if it, in the background is busy so, uh, many things can impact so white balance focusing all this can, can be impact if subject is very busy so you have to be very careful and manual focusing always help you to overcome this uh, condition focus indicators blinks keep work when you are in manual focus mode of lens so you must have seen a uh, blinky dot on your when you viewing through viewfinder so that uh, blinky dots will, will stop blinking when you have a subject in focus so you can use that in viewfinders but you have to press the shutter release button halfway to use that option so that will not straight forward work for you you have to adjust the focus and press the shutter release button halfway it will not focus but it will stop the blinking and it will tell you the subject is in focus and in canon i have seen it makes a noise beep noise when subject gets in focus in manual mode but again you have to press the shutter release button halfway so that's are the signals you will use it in manual mode to identify when the subject is in focus most of the time except stream extreme low light condition this could help you get the subject in tech shop when having manual focus on in extreme light where you can in can't even see with your natural eyes then it's very difficult to focus on but in other light condition you can easily use manual so here today uh, we have so photography session for basic photography and uh, uh, we have covered already the camera settings and part so now we are talking about composition so rule of third uh, rule of third is the composition of methods which comes in our mind first whenever we talk about composition techniques so why it is because it's a very simple technique of of composition and we can make the image look more interesting we can let the viewers eye reach the subject and we can find uh, we can point, place over a subject or point, object which looks interesting around the intersection points so what are the intersection points so 
when we draw two vertical lines and two horizontal lines in the image we find they cross each other so these uh, intersection points are our focal points so focal points uh, we sh should be uh, near to subject or should be around those things which looks very interesting so here you can see focal points primarily i want to place around i which is most interesting part in the I image or at present and i see the body hood structure the tails all look interesting so i place one vertical line so i kept the subject uh, around rule of third and it let the viewers reach the subjects very uh, calmly to and just enjoy the image by placing the subject on one of the four, four focal points uh, where these dividing or lines meet or uh, call intersection points, you will encourage the viewer uh, away from the center of the frame. So the viewer will not looking at the center of the frame. It will try to find the subject around its intersection point. So it's scientifically proven that whenever we are viewing the image, we try to look over the, look the interesting things or try to find interesting things around those intersection points. So that's how you can apply this in any image, any genre of photography. You can easily apply a rule of third. So next uh, composition technique, uh, it's, a, it's a not exact composition technique, but it's a way where we can help to introduce or we can help the image look more uh, clean to eyes, more interesting to eyes, and we can apply composition techniques by making the uh, by cropping or making the subject uh, look so apart from the other um, backgrounds. So background is, would be very clean and image will look very uh, interesting to us. Your goal when composing a photograph should be point to do, point to something. So when we take a photograph, why we take it? Because we find a subject and we find something interesting in that subject so we want to show that to viewer that's why we take that image and we call this as a photograph you want your to look at the, what you are trying to show them one of the way you can do this by cutting out all the clutter of the world and just showing them what you want to see so we have one of the method is that we can uh, uh, take out all the clutter things all the distractions like the I can see some pole uh, on the left uh, side of the image. I can see some uh, distraction on the bottom part. So all these things I don't want to show to viewer. I want to show a clean image. I want. I found this dry flower, and I, it looks uh, very artistic to my eyes. And I, I, I was not having liberty to reach this uh, flower very near, so I have to manage it. From some distance, I couldn't. I do not have a longer focal length, so I could not zoom it. So I have to manage with this frame. So I thought I'll capture it and I'll make it look better in my post processing. And there are techniques so you can achieve this, as a, as I said, by reaching the subject to closer, or we can have a longer focal length if we don't have liberty to reach closer. And we can use a very shallow depth of fields to isolate the subject from background. And we can use shadows. Sometimes we find a uh, condition where a subject is in a place and other uh, shadow is falling around the subject. So we can use shadows to hide those distractions around the subject. So this is the final image. So just see, just see the how it looks like. On the left side, you will have a uh, unprobed or actual composition while it was on camera, and on the right, you will have my final composition. So that's how you can you can uh, have a good out of nothing. So the other composition method is leading lines. This is very simple way of uh, when we have lines in our frame. So if you are lucky and you find some lines in your frame, 
then you can use those lines to uh, lead your viewers eyes to the subject lines that are simply graphic can be used to lead the viewer eye around your images these are called leading lines so when you have lines leading to images the, the those lines will be called as leading lines when you are looking at a scene and deciding how to compose it consider what your subject is first and then consider what elements in the scene might draw the viewers eye towards the subject so you have to consider the elements around it if you are not lucky you are not finding very clean uh, background and all then you have to consider the elements also and it should not distract and it should help viewer to reach the subject using leading lines and you find the receding lines uh, like a fence that draws you to the old house on the hill maybe there is a crack in the concrete leading to a flower so so all these are different elements we can use as a leading lines the viewers eyes will naturally follow the lines so they can be very, very useful in directing people to what you want to them to look at it so whenever we see lines in the image uh, in this example in this image we see some lines uh, created by a web so we try to read the lines first instead of uh, directly viewing at the subject we can because it's lines which is taking us to subject so here you can see multiple lines so the more lines you have the more impact will be in the image if they are reaching to subject so here we have one line on the top here and one line in the center vertical and another di diagonal line again from the down so all these are leading lines and it's reaching to subject even if the subject is in very center it's not on around rule of third but because lines are coming from focal intersection points of rule of thirds, it's adding more impact in image. So I have used rule of third here with leading lines. So I let the lines cross through the intersection points and reach the subjects. So, so that's how the image looks more balanced and more interesting to eyes. Repetition. Evenly spaced, identical, very similar objects uh, can be arranged to create repetitive patterns in your photographs. So when you find elements or group of or array of object, array of objects, elements, well, they look very similar, and uh, we can create a very good repetitive uh, pattern example. Like here, I found this uh, plant tree, uh, tree plant, uh, where the leaves having these uh, lines and it's creating very good repetitive pattern and things like fans pose the lines of and it's pedestrian crossings several crossings or, or outside of trees anything that can be arranged into repetitive pattern can be bring a great intensity to a photograph so anything any repetitive element you find in your image that can add more interest to your image depending on the subject matter it may be calming like a row of pillars on a building or alarming like endless rows of people walking in time so we can have a calm effect or we can have very alarming effect depends on what kind of uh, elements we are using for this pattern so if it's uh, this just a uh, row of pillars it will it will look very calm they are not moving they are just standing there so, but it's still a repetitive pattern but if you find people walking on road and they may look very repetitive they are doing same movement motion but it looks very alarming, very uh, energetic in overall uh, sense in the frame. So here you see that how the lines, they are repetitive in the same pattern. 
that's another repetition. So here over the last uh, uh, composition technique for today's topic, creating layers. So creating layers is really very interesting in photography because uh, it will give you sense of depth in the image. It will add more 3D look feel in out of two dimensional image. Image in actual is a two dimensional, but we can still use this technique to add some more direct dimensions. On one of the technique for adding depth to our image is layering things over the top of other things. So if in this image you can see, I have used people in a uh, in a festival event where they were doing some uh, dance event, and I found a moment where I found one person looks interesting to my eyes, and I I thought I could have easily captured this motion moment and i use the people around it to frame it so i framed that my, my subject with people around it and ultimately i found it they are in uh, different layers so that add more impact simply put uh, you uh, simply put you can cover part of your frame with something closer to the camera in order to give the illusion of depth you can use the leaves of tree to frame a couple of uh, couple in the park. So you must have seen some images from uh, pre-wedding photograph where uh, couple sitting uh, on some uh, branches and all, and some trees around it, some leaves around it, and they are just blurring in front of them, and could have just give illusion of 3D or some depth because. They are uh, leaves are well in front of them, but they are in blurry. So they are not adding or uh, giving any distraction, but they are adding some effect. Some empty glasses on the table while the uh, bartender is coming, and also you can see you can you can create these effects in any event. Or an audience listening to speakers, so you can capture uh, to a point of view where you are in in the middle of audience and you are capturing the speaker. So you can add your listening audience in the frame. That will add some effect. In very very frequently, we use this in corporate events. We'll, 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 we'll not just capture the speaker, we'll capture the audience in the same frame and that will add more impact. All of these things not fill, only fill the frame with interesting elements, they further the story you are trying to tell. So it's a storytelling uh, uh, composition techniques. So it's just not add the elements in the image, it just also uh, increase uh, make storytelling technique uh, very impactful so in this image so this is over the uh, first uh, layer we can say the person just very near to the uh, lens. Second is just a little bit far or away from the lens. The third layer is very near to subject just before. And this is this is this is this is this was the person or the subject where I set my focal point. So when, whenever we are viewing any image, we are traveling through different layers. So that adds an effect of depth and it gives some 3D look in overall. And it's an event, so we can, feel, we can send some uh, story out of it because they were looking at something and we can just let the viewer think about it or uh, just uh, to be in curious state where they think that what they are looking at so it's also add some interest 
so of course uh, these are not only the elements of composition there are many and they are only the basics in this basic workshop and that is only i can cover in the in the uh, composition part in this workshop uh, it's a very limited time and uh, i hope you are very taking with the positive points here and you will try to improve your composition techniques so thank you so much for your participation you can enter your questions in the chat then we can discuss about uh hi sumit sir uh, this is vamshi yes so it was uh, it was a great, uh, great opportunity to have this workshop uh, like i have a kind of a moderate photographer not an amateur not an expert uh, so i have learned uh, many things in the session uh, previously i just only uh, Uh, now i got to know the proper concepts from you uh, in a like a sequential manner that is uh, very much useful uh, so i have learned a few things uh, which i'll be implementing those in my further photographs if you add your questions in the chat that will be better for me okay. to understand because your voice is not clear okay okay fine just add your questions here so whenever the questions appear in my chat i'll just uh, discuss on that uh, first come first serve so someone asked that what is the main rule uh, in choosing the focusing option and the continuous mode the single one shot single servo is that you are talking about focusing yes. options yes yes okay so focusing mode so when we are uh, selecting focusing mode so try to keep it very simple because uh, most of the time i advise you should be in afs uh, mode but in for continuous focus most of the time you will see the image is in sharp but you are sometimes losing the subject so if your subject moves away or you did some handshake then your focal point will change shift to other uh, point Uh, other other element in the frame, so that can impact your white balance. That can impact your sharpness on the point where you want to focus. So you have to be very careful on that part. So focusing mode, I always advise try to be on single shot, one shot, AFS, whatever term you are using to understand. So try to be on that. But if subject is moving, if you find subject is doing movement and you want to Uh, capture the subject uh, where in sharp details. Then you have to be in continuous mode, continuous focusing mode. But most of the time, you will find yourself using only single shot, uh, single or single servo, where you will lock the focus. So when you are locking focus, you are sure that subject will be around that same distance. so try to keep it simple the more simple approach you will take the more better result you will get i hope i have answered if uh, you think that you are asking some uh, different question or you are expecting different uh, you can no 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 the same question uh, i got the answer yeah thank you and thank you thank you for everything Welcome.